Thank you. Um, when you were a child, and possibly you knew of incidents where children ask their parents difficult questions, one of the questions when a child discovers that there is something going on where people kill each other with guns, it's called war, a child in its innocence will ask, why is there war? And it's a very good question, but adults, burdened by history, burdened by the psychology of our social behavior, are just flummoxed about how to answer that question. But we do have answers, and they're actually part of the problem of why war exists. Because one of the most prevalent answers would be there are bad people in the world, and we have to protect ourselves from them. And that's why there is war, because people, bad people want to hurt us. That's, and that will be an answer that will be in Farsi and Tehran. It will be in Chinese in Beijing and Mandarin. It will be in English in Washington, D.C. It will be in the language of the culture and country in which the question is asked. And the answer is always the that there are bad people who want to hurt us and we have to protect ourselves. Um, a really precocious child would ask, Mommy, are we some of the bad people? But that's rare for that to get asked. Because the assumption is always that those other people are the bad people. And I just want to mention that there are definitely some very bad characters in the world. But we always, not just we, but every culture, every nation, every people, will compare the rather nasty people that are out there, who are singular people, Hitler is a kind of major example of that, we will compare that with the most noble, the most meaningfully generous parts in our culture. For example, we would never compare it with the atrocities that were perpetrated by Americans at Abu Ghraib in Iraq. We don't want to hear about that. And so the comparison is always made unequally. So I'm not saying that there aren't bad actors in the world, but they are never the ones in the popular culture that ask the question. Now, another answer um, might be a little more realistic. Uh, war has always existed. I don't know why it exists. Nobody does. It's just one of those things. And that's another, another possible answer. I want to give you some answers today that are not that vague, not that uh, indefinite, that in fact put some meat on the answer of why is there a war. So um, let's go to it. We're not the only ones. And and war is very old and very universal among cultures. Um, it doesn't mean that it's always existed, and there are people who would like to argue that it's very rare and has only occurred in modern culture. Uh, but these are, uh, this is a hunter-gatherer tribe in the New Guinea Highlands, and this is a photograph taken in the early 20th century. And these are two tribes at war with each other. They're hunter-gatherers, they're not modern civilization, they don't have weapons of modern type. 
But you know just from the mythology of the movies and everything else that war is quite pervasive. So why is this? Well, humanity is not one individual. Humanity is a large number of individuals who come together socially. We're the most social species on the planet. We are kin to ants and chimpanzees, which are also enormously social. Ants are social, they bind together in a group because they're chemically uh, activated in their behavior. Uh, and they will go to war against another group of ants that are too close to them. And the main thing they're fighting over is territory because the territory is the source of their food. And that's also true of hunter-gatherers and true of humanity, true today. There are things that um, are valuable and that's what's being fought over. So we're not only individuals, we are groups, tribes, because individuals could never prevail against a whole band of other individuals. We band together in groups because that gives us power. But of course, others band together in groups because that gives them power. And therefore, the entities that are struggling against each other are groups. Within the groups, there are tremendous amounts of love, cooperation, self-sacrifice. But outside the group, it's a different story. So tribes cooperate within, but it's an unfortunate fact of the world of life that they prey on one another without. They prey on one another because there's an advantage in it. It's an advantage to basically steal from others. But we don't steal individually. That, in fact, is prohibited. That's sinful. But if, if you want to have a strict biblical code, that's one of the commandments. But if you want to steal from the Assyrians or the other tribes which the Israelites felt were ungodly, that was perfectly legitimate. In fact, God ordered it in many cases. So if tribes are going to prey on one another, the only tribes that are going to survive in an evolutionary universe are those who defend themselves against the predation. And the combination of that pair is what leads to war. Does it have to be that way? Not necessarily. But we have evolved as human beings with predation and defense against predation as part of our genome and part of our culture. How about predation? Do we, do, we, do we experience it ourselves? Yes. When I was a child, well, I was, I was, I was in like the eighth grade, we uh, were studying U.S. history, and they showed a picture of Teddy Roosevelt, who was at that time, he wasn't president yet, he, he was the, the leader of an army division called the Rough Riders. And it was him in the Philippines. Um, they were battling Spain in the Philippines. And they defeated the Spaniards. And over the years, I don't think it was precisely then, maybe it was in high school when we were studying history a little more seriously, I was thinking, what is Teddy Roosevelt doing in the Philippines thousands and thousands of miles away from the United States? And the answer to that is slightly complex and involves some history, which is that Spain was a world power up until the late 19th century when they were losing their colonies, and one of the col and they had colonies in the New World. They had a colony in Cuba. And so there was a Spanish-American War in which there was a fight in Cuba, and the U.S. easily defeated the Spaniards there. And then 
having defeated the Spaniards, they thought, Teddy Roosevelt thought, Spain has the Philippines as a colony. We can go get it. And they did. And they went and got it. And it's been a colony of the U.S. It's, it's starting to come undone at this point. But I certainly do remember having lots of Filipino friends. I grew up in California. And so our attachment to the Philippines comes from that act of predation that we preyed on the Philippines because there was money in it, there was treasure in it, there was uh, territory and wealth. All I'm doing is repeating here what I said about within the tribe there is great self-sacrifice, love, care, and outside the tribe is aggression, mistrust, hatred, and war. Now, this is an answer to the child who is asking the question of why is there a war? I'm going to tell you some counterintuitive explanations. It's counterintuitive because you're not going to believe them at first, because they seem, they seem wrong. But I want to bring out two counterintuitive aspects of war that explain why it is enduring and why it might be coming to an end. Why has war persisted throughout history? Because the casualties in war are historically always low. Um, now you may say, well, well that's, a, that's crazy because we want the casualties in war to be low. We don't want them to be high. But it's that fact that the casualties are not high that makes it attractive to keep doing it. If the casualties in war were 50, 60 percent, first of all, you couldn't go to war again for another generation or so until you bred more men. So, low casualty rate is not a good sign for a creature like we are that has to learn truths from behavior. We don't learn truths very well that we reason out in our minds. We learn them from experience. And when you burn your hand several times on the stove, you stop touching it. And when you go to war several times, and there's nothing but misery and suffering and death and destruction, you'll stop doing it. But it hasn't been that way. The casualty rates... Look at this. The U.S. Civil War, which is a pretty terrible civil war, which is a pretty terrible war. There wasn't a lot of medicine around. So if you got wounded seriously, you were probably going to die from infection. So it was, a, it was a war with a fairly high rat casualty rate. How high? Was it 60% or even 50% or even 30%? No, it was 2%. If it had been 50%, there would have been a whole lot of rethinking about if we're going to go to war again. World War I, the U.S. lost only 0.13%. But many others lost much more. Russia lost 2%, the UK was 2%, France 4%, Germany 4%. And I want to bring forward some big losses. In World War II, Russia lost 15%. What about the US of A? Not even 1%. Not even a half of 1%. And yet we think of it as a very major war. Why did we go to war in Korea and Vietnam? Because that figure was so low. Now, I won't argue that that's absolutely the only reason. But if that figure had not been that low, it wouldn't have happened. Another alternative of how people could deal with one another would have worked its way out. So the typical casualty rate of 2%, wars are going to continue. Casualty rate greater than 25%, wars are going to cease because at a 25% casualty rate, you lose half your males and you're not going to go to war again until you bring them back in another generation. Uh, just for the record, the highest casualty recorded rate was in the Paraguayan Brazilian War of 1864 to 1871. 
half the population died. A population of about 400,000 people, 200,000 people were killed. At the end of that war, only 30% of the male population remain. The rest are all females and children. So you're not going to go to war again very quickly after that. And the Peregrines and the Brazilians, as far as I know, have not been at war. Um, next. Now the other counterintuitive thing I want to bring to your attention is the end of major power wars, like world wars. Wars in which Russia and the U.S. are at each other, or Germany and Britain, or France and England. Those kinds of wars where major powers confront each other, 1945 to the present, they have stopped. Now, there have been proxy wars where these major powers are basically the proxies behind the war that's going on. But there is a certain limitation that happens because they themselves are not involved. Go ahead. Why is this? Because of weapons of mass destruction. And you will say, in the same way you would say, we want, we don't, we want to have a low casualty rate in war. You would also say, we do not want weapons of mass destruction. Now, um, for many years, back in the 1970s and 80s, when the nuclear submarine Trident missile system was being explore, exploited and sent out all over the world, I was enormously against that. And I spoke and I cared and I reasoned against it. Because it really is a very obscene thing. It's obscene, that kind of destruction. Um, but in recent years, I've come to see this effect that it's really put the brake on any kind of attempt to have a major power war. Those weapons are all loaded and pointed, but there's an enormous self-restraint to let them go. And it's true that crazy people can perhaps get into power, but it's also true that there are plenty of people who are going to grab them and say, stop it, you're not going to do that. And the religious impulse to engage in nuclear war, I experienced personally when I was in college. I didn't experience an impulse. I experienced a professor of religion, actually it's a professor of philosophy. His name is Fritz Wilhelmsen. And he spoke very eloquently about how Christianity was under threat from the communist menace, and it was, un, it was godless communism against Christianity. And he lectured very powerfully about the morality of nuclear war, saying, if we could see that the communists, either the Chinese and the Russians, or both of them together, were about to take over the world, we would be morally obligated to destroy them with all of our nuclear weapons, even destroying ourselves, and go to glory with God in heaven. This was 1960, roughly. Actually, pretty close to the Cuban Missile Crisis time. So I experienced this kind of thinking. Uh, fortunately, it hasn't worked out that way. But weapons of mass destruction really are a break. What's stopping uh, Trump from invading North Korea. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, North Korea. Uh, it's the size of the weapons. Even if you don't use nuclear weapons, there are these enormously, enormous artillery pieces that are arranged all over, the, all over the, the border between the Koreas. It would be one bloody god-awful mess. So he doesn't do it. Thank God. Uh, go ahead. 
So, weapons of mass destruction also equals high casualties. High casualty means you're not going to do war. As somebody cynically might put it, you know, we're not doing war anymore because there's no money in it. Uh, next. So we have been 80, 80 years without major power war. That is unprecedented. I want to say something now about war, men, big men, men who are uh, both gifted with the capacity and the urge to be big men who control lots of people, women, and sex. This is the 12th century BC. It's from a vase, a Greek vase. And what's going on here is a woman, her name is Perseus, and you see that some one man has her arm and he's taking her as a wife, consort, and he's taking her from another man who is Achilles. I won't go into all the details about this, um, of why this is happening now that way, but they are both Greeks. They're on the same side, but they're not very peaceful uh, companions in the Trojan War. In fact, there's a kind of enmity between them. The point of this is that women have always been pawns for men. Then women have always been taken by men. And there's good biological reasons for that. In this time, uh, 13th century character came out of Mongolia, swept across Central Asia and into China. He had the genius of turning the grass that grew on those plains into men and horses. And with men and horses, he conquered all of these major Central uh, Asian cities. And when they conquered the city, they would collect all the men together and slit their throats. So there was mass murder of thousands and thousands of male captives, but not the women, not the women. The women were taken as wives, and the daughters of the men who were killed were taken for the Mongol warriors, including some of the best for Genghis and his sons themselves. What's the result of that? Interesting discovery made a few years ago when people started studying the genomes of all the people in Europe and Central Asia. And they found that one out of 200 men carries a strong signature of the gene that Genghis Khan carried. So how did this work? The Mongols cut off the genetic future of the people they conquered, and they replaced it with their future. And that's why women were not in this fight. They were just pawns in this fight. Next. Is he the only one? No, not at all. There's a famous character in Ireland called Niall of the Nine Hostages, lived about 400 AD. One in five Irishmen is descended from his genes because he did the same thing. He would slay the men that he conquered and take their women. Mule Ishmael, much more recent fellow, he lives in the uh, 18th century. He had over a thousand children by 50 wives and uncountable concubines. And he was a fierce warrior. Um, and again, the same thing happens with uh, 
key supplying the genetic material to go on. Right. Let's come up to the present. We have big men in the present. Big men that involve women and sex. Saddam Hussein, we don't know a whole lot about his harem of women, but you can be sure that he had them. And Donald Trump, we know a lot more about his harem. Now, in the once we have commerce and money, you don't necessarily have to kill to get a harem. You can buy them. This is uh, Saddam Hussein's palace, where his image adorns the palace. He's a big man, and he wants a big palace with his image. Yes. This is one of Trump's casinos, the Taj Mahal. He imagines himself as a great potentate out of the East, and he expects to put his name on a big building, and put his image on the painting that he just showed him. Yes. And these are the women he bought. He owns the, or he used to own, I think he's gotten out of it now, the uh, Miss Universe contest. And it was, it was great. He could buy women. You don't have to kill the men, you can just buy them. And he did. So here are the women he bought. And he's notably famous for when the women are preparing for the events of expecting to go into the dressing rooms while they're dressing and parade around and be a big man. So here's a quotation from the tradition of Genghis Khan. I have no idea whether he actually said this, but he's fairly late and there were people trying to record things that he said. So he says, the greatest enjoyment of a man is to overcome his enemies, drive them before him, snatch what they have, to see the people to whom they are dear with their faces bathed in tears. Boy, does that feel good. To ride their horses. Oh, that's important. The Mongols, the horse was their mechan was the war machine, was the horse. And to take another man's horse for yourself while well, he's getting his throat slit and riding, it's the greatest pleasure. And finally, to take their daughters and wives into his arms. Donald Trump says, I start kissing her. You know I'm like automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. Just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're their star, you let them, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. You can do anything, just like Dennis Khan could do anything. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now. I want to talk about the lie of war, because it contains a lie. And the lie is that good people have to kill bad people. The truth of war is that good people kill other good people. That's the truth. We compare our most noble people with the most brutal of the other to justify our participation in war. But all the millions of people that have been killed in wars, are they all villains? No. They're almost helpless 17 and 8 year olds who have been pulled into the war and because of the group Psychology, the herd instinct of war, are there on Omaha Beach at the invasion in the Second World War, dying by the scores, by the hundreds, by the thousands. Kids, are they, are they these evil demons? No. They're the good people who get killed by other good people. Were the Germans terrible people? No. They had a leader who was pretty terrible. But the ones who paid the price, the ones who were killed, were just ordinary folks like all of these other soldiers 
who were sent into this battle. Innocent and innocent against innocent. Their only, their only guilt is being human. Their only guilt is carrying this kind of genetic cultural heritage. And, as you know, genes that were once very beneficial, as the environment changes, can become dangerous, maladaptive. The two famous examples are the uh, cystic fibrosis genes, which play a role in cleansing the uh, airways of human beings. Now, our ancestors had to deal with environments that were enormously dusty. You've seen some of the photographs of people, especially in the Iraq War, where they have these dust storms and people have their faces wrapped. And, well, our ancestors had to deal with that. They had to deal with fires, smoking, uh, atmospheres. And they developed some genetic resistance, which these cystic fibrosis genes are part of that. But when that's not the situation, when you're not constantly dealing with toxic environments, these genes create too much fluid, too much uh, of their activity, and it leads to maladaptive results. Uh, the other one is um, the, uh, the gene that uh, a lot of African Americans have, sickle cell anemia, which has protective effects against uh, malaria. But like a lot of genetic uh, actions, it also has a downside. And the downside is that sickle cell, which is more uh, problematic in making its way through the blood vessels. So my sense is that there's a way in which we could look at war as a genetic cultural disease. It's riding on genes, it's riding on these male genes that uh, I showed you are carried by these historical figures, including men of our time, including me and the men who are here, including Donald Trump. And on, on those genes is writing culture. So the culture is moving those genes in particular directions. That a different culture might move them differently. They, don't, they didn't have to go that way. Now, there are limits to what you can do with culture and genes. You can't just make anything you want out of a gene. But the genes that you draw forward and the genes that you repress, and it's a major mechanism of how uh, biology works, this depends on the culture. So, A very good way of thinking about war is it's a maladaptive behavior. It was advantageous once, that's why it's here, that's why it's present, but it's not, it's not adaptive now. And we can see it even in practice. You can see it in the civil war in Syria, which is a disaster in which there are no winners, everybody is just losing. They can't help it. They can't stop it. Um, so, good people kill other good people. Now, how does that work? Turn other people into bad people in the mind. And how often have you heard this? The military lives on this dichotomy. Good guys and bad guys. When you hear politicians and the military talk about war situations or problems that they're facing and the nature of war, 
they always talk about good guys and bad guys. That's really important. It's also important to just say it's a lie. It's like at Omaha Beach when enormous numbers of Germans, enormous numbers of Brits and Americans died who were just ordinary Joes. But they were bad guys. No. Next. Are we going in backwards? Keep going. So, one of the things that you have to do is overcome the natural resistance we have as human beings to hurt, let alone kill another. If you try to hurt someone, you're going to have a tre tremendously emotional experience. I mean, if I really tried to grab them and hurt you right now, I'm going to start sweating, I'm going to start feeling badly, I'm going to start feeling sick. We've got built-in emotional mechanisms to stop us from doing that. And of course they're there because you might be one of my tribal mates. We need each other because there are bad guys out there. So, in the good guy, bad guy scenario, you have to find a way to overcome the natural resistance we have to kill others. One of the ways to do that is do not get to know actual enemy soldiers. And in fact, you could be executed for fraternizing with uh, the enemy soldier. You could be court-martialed. You could be severely punished. They do not want you to know the other soldier. That's part of making it work. Next. Now, here's something else that's it's really quite amazing that I'm not going to even talk about it today because it, it deserves a whole lecture in itself. The other thing is to lose oneself with one's comrades in combat to a transcendent spiritual state. Now, this is a real phenomenon, and it's testified to by people who actually have been in war. I'm going to devote a whole lecture to that. The next lecture that comes up in March will be devoted to that. So I'm not going to say much more about it today. I will mention that I, I, have a, I have had a cousin who was a Marine and was in Afghanistan. And he testified to this. He said, the best time in my life was when I was with my buddies in Afghanistan, when we were under fire, when we protected and saved one another. I felt, I just felt the highest moment I'd ever felt in my life, that I was really worth something, that we were doing something. We were just vibrantly alive because we were close to dying. And when I met him and he told me about these experiences, and he's just in his early 20s, he was working in a gun shop in Tracy, California. And the best he could do to replicate it, he said, I miss it. I wish I was back in Afghanistan with my buddies. Okay, so these are two, of, this is one of the things that you have to do, is overcome the natural resistance to kill, because nature gives us resistance to killing other people. Next. So, to make those things realities, you have to come under the sway of a herd instinct. You notice that my cousin wanted to be back with other men. He needed that community to make it happen. And the pressure of the war made the community cohere and allowed them to shoot and kill lots of bad guys, which he told me about. So the herd instinct is important. And the loss of human individuality is important. I'm going to say more about this because one of the aspects of transcendent experience is to lose your individuality. 
suddenly become part of some cosmic whole. War can do that. It's not the only thing that can do that, but war can do that. Next. Uh, here's something that uh, a wonderful uh, philosopher and I don't know, just a wonderful human being said, Simone Weil. And this was in uh, her meditation on the Iliad, the story of the Trojan War, a very classic epic. He said, might in war is that which makes a thing of anybody who comes under its sway. And when it exercises to the full, it makes a thing of a man in the most literal sense for it. It makes him a corpse. Next. I'm going to read you a memoir of a great American author, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. It's from a longer piece that Clemens wrote. So he's uh, in Hannibal, Missouri, and of course, in the beginning of the war, there were some Union soldiers kind of slowly making their way down in reconnaissance missions, and there were Confederates who were trying to form themselves into groups. There was like a whole bunch of these, these, these units hadn't been fully formed yet. They were sort of getting, figuring out how they could be soldiers. And then there were some leaders who were trying to get them together. So a leader came in and they tried to form a militia in Hannibal because there were Union infiltrators already around. And they did that. And, Cle and Clemens was part of this militia of like six men in their unit. And they had heard that there were Union soldiers in a farmhouse not far away. And so they approached it and they were scared, and they kind of reconnoitered around it, but they didn't really try to attack it. And while they're sitting in the woods, a lone figure comes, and it's a Union. They, they thought it was a Union soldier. It probably was. And they all shot and knocked him off his horse, and there he lay, and Clemens, I'll pick up the story there. I was down by him in a moment, helplessly stoking his forehead, and I would have given anything, my own life freely, to make him again what he had been five minutes before. And all the boys seemed feeling the same way. They hung over him full of pitying interest and tried all they could to help him and said all sorts of regretful things. They had forgotten all about the enemy. They thought only of this one forlorn unit of the foe. Once my imagination persuaded me, the dying man gave me a reproachful look out of the shadow of his eyes. And it seemed to me that I could rather that he had stabbed me than that he had done that. He muttered and mother, mumbled like a dreamer in his sleep about his wife and his child. And I thought with a new despair, this thing that I have done does not end with him. It falls upon them too. And they never did me any harm any more than he. And I'd like to read you one last memoir of a killing of a soldier. This is by William Manchester, and this is actually from the Second World War in the, Jap in the Pacific Theater. The killing of a Japanese soldier. My first shot had missed him, embedding itself in the straw wall, but the second caught him dead on in the femoral artery. 
His left side blossomed, turning swiftly to mush. A wave of blood gushed from the wound, then another boiled out, sleeting across his legs, pooling on the earthen floor. Mutely, he looked down at it, he dipped his hand in it, and listlessly smeared his cheek red. His shoulders gave a little spasmodic jerk, as though someone had whacked him on the back. Then he emitted a tremendous raspy fart, slumped down, and continued to sink until he reached the earthen floor. His eyes glazed over. Yet seeing death at this range, like smelling it, requires no previous experience. You instantly recognize a spastic convulsion and a death rattle, not loud, not loud but deprecating and conciliatory. Jerking my head to shake off the stupor, I began to tremble, and next to shake all of them. There you see our natural resistance, our natural disposition, that we are built biologically not to do this, and you really have to work hard to overcome it. I saw it in a voice still grating with fear, I'm sorry. Then I threw up all over myself. I recognized a half-digested sea ration being dribbling down my front. At the same time, I noticed another odor. I had urinated in my cities. I had become a thing of tears and twitching and dirty pants, and I wondered dumbly, is this what they mean by conspicuous gallantry? Well, I'm going to end there, and we can have some questions if you like. I think I'm going to just mention one last slide. Okay, just for the record, and you'll get notice of these from the mailing list if you're on them. If you're not on the mailing list, uh, speak to me or speak to Beth about getting on the mailing list for future talks. War, Love, and Transcended Experience, on um, Sunday, March 18th. Again, I think that might be the third Sunday. And Peace and Love is the final lecture. I'll say something about that. That's actually April the 16th. No, it is the 15th. Yes, that's correct. April the 15th. It's a Sunday. Same thing. Three time. Okay. Um, so thank you, and if you have some questions or things you'd like to share, we have a few minutes and we can do that and then we have refreshments.